Hello, thank you. Um, as you said, my name is Anna. Uh, I work at MongoDB in Stockholm. And I'm going to talk about a project called Bison Transpilers. If I'm going too quickly, or if something doesn't make sense, just wave. I can kind of see you. Um, but I have a lot to get through, so I'm going to go pretty fast. So in order to tell you about Bison Transpilers, which is basically a meta transpiler, which means it's a piece of code that generates transpilers. So the first thing I'm going to do is talk about feature requirements. So what, from the user's perspective, brought us to write this piece of code. And then going to refine those feature requirements to technical requirements, so something that we can actually solve. And then lastly, I'm going to tell you how it works and how to contribute. So my goal for this talk is to hopefully inspire everybody here to contribute themselves. Um, if that's not your thing, then I am at least excited to tell you about a project I think is really cool. So first off, who here has used MongoDB before? Great, that's a lot. How many people have used Compass? That is also a lot. Great. So for those of you who have not used Compass, Compass is basically the UI for MongoDB. So you can manage your data. You can do um, some administration. You can build queries and aggregations through our visual aggregation pipeline builder. Um, but I highly recommend checking it out if you haven't before. But the feature that I want to talk about specifically is called export to language. So the thing to know about MongoDB is that you write queries in the MongoDB query syntax. So like SQL, but MQL. MQL is made up of BSON, which is basically extended JSON. So when I say the query language or I say BSON, you can just think about it like extended JSON. So all of the MongoDB tools use a specific JavaScript-based syntax to write this query language. That's called the shell syntax because it's what the shell uh, uses. But generally, when you're writing an application, you write your application in Python or Java, probably in this room, JavaScript. But you don't actually write your application using the shell syntax. So you use all of these tools, including education and everything like that in shell. But then you have to switch into your application language. So that's kind of painful. So what this feature does is it takes the aggregation or query that you've built in Compass, and you can export it to whatever development language you prefer. So that's what it looks like for queries, and this is what it looks like for aggregations. It's also used on Atlas, which is basically MongoDB's online offering. So that's a great feature, right? But it would be probably better if you could just skip writing shell syntax entirely. So say you want to use Compass and you're a Python developer, you can just open up Compass, set it to Python mode, and then from that point on, write all of your queries, aggregations, see examples, have everything written only in Python, or in Java, or in C++, whatever you like. So that feature is called language modes. It is what it sounds like. You have a Python mode or a C++ mode, et cetera. So those are our feature requirements. Let's talk about technical requirements. So as a developer, something I want to emphasize from the beginning uh, is that BSON, so basically extended JSON, is a complex enough subset of any given language that you need to basically parse the whole language. So we can make our lives easier later on by skipping stuff like class definitions. But generally, when we approach the problem from the beginning, we want to treat the problem as if we're translating from all of Python to all of C++. So that's important to remember. So to summarize, we have to accept queries in any language. We have to export into any language. What does that give us? Anything to anything. So this is what I mean by saying we transpile anything to everything. So if you want to write your queries in Rust and then export them into C-sharp, we need to support that. If you want to write your queries in JavaScript and export it to C-sharp, we also need to support that. So how do we solve this technical problem? Well, the obvious way would be to write one transpiler for every combination of languages. So when I say transpiler, I can also say compiler. They're basically the same thing. The only difference is that generally, Compilers go from user-written languages to machine code, while transpilers go between uh, 
programming languages, but as JavaScript developers, you probably already know that. So obviously, the naive approach is not great. What do other people do? So we can do something called an intermediate representation, which solves this problem of having to write the same transpiler many times by having a intermediate data representation. So in one step, we transpile from our input language into an intermediate representation. And then in a second step, we go from that intermediate representation into our target language. So that looks like this. A uh, popular use case of this is LLVM IR. Um, so if you ever use Clang uh, or any tool like that, it's based on LLVM IR. So what this does is it transpiles all these different languages into this intermediate representation. It then transpiles it down into the platform-specific machine code. But you can see from this diagram that the targets are not exactly what we're looking for, right? So our goal is to go user language to user language. The goal of LLVM is to have platform support for basically anything. So if we were to use the LLVM project directly, then we would have to write transpilers that go from intermediate representation back into user written code. And I don't know if anyone here has ever read uh, decompiled Java code, for example, but um, it's a mess. And you lose a lot of information when you go from human readable to intermediate representation. And it's a really hard problem to go back to something that actually looks like a human being wrote it. So we don't want to solve that problem right here, right now. So what about using intermediate representation but not LLVM? So just to give you an example, this is a really simple Python function. This is just a linear regression. This is what it looks like in intermediate representation. So this is actually about a third of the generated code. But this is just to give you an idea of we don't want to design our own intermediate representation. That's like a PhD thesis. That's way too much work for this project. So we can't really use intermediate representations as a concept if we want to be able to solve this in the most optimal way we can. So if I say transpiler, you say bubble, right? So how does bubble work? Generally, what they do is they go from many different versions of JavaScript into many other versions of JavaScript. So unfortunately, bubble parser only really deals with JavaScript input. So that doesn't solve our problem of wanting to transpile between R or C sharp, that type of thing. But we can go back in a little bit to talk about how Babel actually works. So to formalize our problem, the two things that we really want to ensure, first is that first slide about having many different transpilers. We don't want to do this in the slowest way possible in terms of development time, which means that we only want to have to do the work one time per language. This means that if I am adding support for Rust to the transpiler that already supports input in, say, C sharp and C, I don't want to write one C sharp to Rust transpiler and then do something again for C support. I want to just do that one time. So what that means is we basically want to solve it in linear time. The second half of that, which is a subtle difference but also very important, is that we want to make sure that you can add support for a new language without being an expert in any other language. So again, if you're writing support for Rust, you don't need to know or care that there is support for JavaScript or for Python. Also, I work remotely. Uh, I have colleagues in Berlin, in New York, in uh, Sydney, and we all basically do work in strange time zones, we want to be able to do distributed development on this tool and not have to worry about merge conflicts or having two people add support for two different languages at the same time. They shouldn't have to overlap at all. So this is an important point. The MongoDB community is huge. They've pretty much tried to use MongoDB with every language that exists, whether or not it's a good idea or not. So, this is basically what I said before. We want to be able to design the project with distributed development in mind from the beginning. So to summarize what we need technically, arbitrary number of input languages, arbitrary number of output languages, 
And we basically can never be certain that someone will never use a given language with MongoDB. So we have to support everything. We need to think about distributed development. We also need to think about people's expertise. Generally, people are expert in one or two languages, not in every language. We want a linear time development cost. And if I forgot to mention, uh, Compass is an Electron app, which means that we want to do it in web-friendly JavaScript because it's also getting reused um, on, by the cloud team. So that was really fast, but that's our technical requirements, and that's our uh, feature requirements. So how do you actually contribute to this project? So in order to talk about this transpiler, I'm going to need to talk a little bit about Compiler 101. So if any of you have taken a compiler's course before, this might look familiar. Um, otherwise, hopefully this is enough information to understand what's going on. So this is a general diagram of the stages of compilation. Um, my coworker, Arena, made these illustrations. They're very beautiful. So, uh, and she added a bunch for this talk. So if you see an illustration, and it is beautiful, it is Arena's illustration. If you see one that is not beautiful, it is my illustration. So, for example, this is tree building. So the first stage of compilation is always going to be you take your input and you build a representation in memory of that input. Generally, it's a tree. So what you do in this case is you take an input, which for this example is just a document with one key value pair, and you build a tree that has a root node of the type. And then in this case, since we have only one key value, we have one child for the key, one child for the value. The value itself is recursively defined as a function call. So this is what trees look like when you take parsed input. So this is this stage. We start with our input, we create a tree, and then we do code generation. And so what I'm talking about is also known as parsing. So the thing to know about parsers is that they're an absolute pain in the ass. You do not want to write a parser, trust me. So if you can get away with not writing a parser, that's definitely what you want to do. So what I decided to use is Antler. So Antler is an open source parser generator, which means that you give it a grammar and it generates a parser for you. It also has a JavaScript target, which is really convenient for us. So this is this stage I'm talking about. Antler gives us our tree, which means that this first parsing and tree building stage is totally handled. We get that completely for free. So how do you generate code given a tree? One second. So has anyone here used a visitor before? Great. That's a decent amount. So for those who haven't, you don't have to worry about how a visitor is actually implemented. You just think about a visitor as a way to traverse a tree. And for every type of node in the tree, you have a different method on the visitor. So for example, if I have a single string, I will have a string node in my tree, and then my visitor will have a visit string method. And it gets automatically called when I traverse the tree and find a string node. So in terms of implementing a visitor, you just fill out those methods for each type of node. So for an example, say we want to transpile from JavaScript to Java. So for those of you in the audience with good vision, you can see that the difference between JavaScript and Java is, yes, these. So you have single quotes with JavaScript and you have double quotes with Java. So this is a really simple example, but it's also the building block upon which everything with this transpiler is on top of. So the first thing we do is we apply Antler to our input and we get a tree. This is great because we do no work. We then apply the visitor. So what the visitor does is it's going to see, oh, we have a string node. Let's call our string method. And if we want to do translation inside of our string method, since in this case we're going from JavaScript to Java, the first thing we need to do is extract the value. And that's this first line here. And then just add double quotes around the value. And you have now translated your string between languages. 
So what does antler actually look like? So what this show is showing you right here is just you have a binary expression, one plus two. My left child is a one, my right child is a two, my middle child is the operator. So that's sort of the general idea of what a tree would look like for this case. I can actually show you what antler generates. So what I'm doing here is I am using the antler plugin for IntelliJ, which I highly recommend. Um, this is the grammar, so this is the definition of the language. I'm looking at ECMAScript right now. Can you see that? So if I want to see what a tree looks like, I can zoom, oops. Can make that really big so you can see that. And you can see that the tree actually gets generated from the input that I'm writing. So in this case, if I have my binary expression, you can see here, big enough? I can make it even bigger. So I have all these other nodes, but if you look at the basic outline of the tree, you have an additive expression, you have your left child and your right child, and you have your operator. So that's what it looks like in uh, JavaScript. Let's try it in Python. So say I'm doing the same thing in Python. So if you see here, I also have an arithmetic expression with my left child and my right child. But you can kind of tell here that this tree is a different shape than the other tree. So the basic concept is the same. We'll always have an ad additive node with the right amount of children. But I have a bunch of other stuff going on here. So what is that stuff? Cool. So now we've hit upon a really important point that you should remember because this informs the design of the entire transpiler. So what Antler creates is something called a parse tree. So parse trees retain all of the information from the original code that was um, parsed, including all of the tokens. What most compilers use is something called an abstract syntax tree. So an AST is just a optimized, generalized parse tree. So you remove all of the information specific to the input from the tree, and then you create a new tree, which is called an abstract syntax tree. So that's the difference here. The thing about antler is that antler trees are parse trees, and they're read-only, which means that we can't take our parse tree and move it into an AST unless we want to do a lot of work. So we can't do exactly what Babel does, because if you look at this, you can see that what they do is first they create a parse tree, then they create the generated tree from the parse tree, and then they visit that generated abstract syntax tree. So what we are going to do is we have to visit that parse tree directly. So this is what our series of uh, stages will look like. We're going to go input, parse tree, and then directly to code generation. So I mentioned before that we're going to use a visitor. And I may have mentioned that Antler actually generates a visitor class for us. So this is another huge benefit, because Antler creates these visitor classes that are basically empty. They're shell visitors that have one method for every single node that is defined in the grammar. The thing to know about the different grammars is that since Antler is open source and all these different people are writing uh, grammars, for all these different coding paradigms, you have quite different naming between the languages. So for example, in JavaScript, you would use camel case, while in Python, you'd use snake case or uh, underscores. So this is what the generated visitor looks like. All it does is it defines the set of visit methods and just recurs on the child. So if you were to run this visitor on your input, you would just get back originally what you put in. So we are going to extend this visitor in order to do specifically the translation. So because these nodes between different grammars are named differently, it means that we need a different visitor for every input language. But unfortunately, we need to do the same thing for each of these nodes. We just need the names of the visitor methods to be different. So what we can do is we can abstract away the differences between the two trees. So our visitors 
for the tree specifically specific to the language is going to act more like a wrapper around the tree than an actual visitor. So we can do that by having a shared superclass and being quite creative with our uh, object construction. So because inheritance in JavaScript is very, uh, very fast and loose, we can kind of create a shared superclass that is actually a subclass. And I'll show you what that looks like. So we have our Python visitor on the left, and we have our JavaScript visitor on the right. So if you can see the difference here is that these visit and expressions are basically just spelled differently. And so what we do in our shared superclass is we have our actual code generation logic. And so when you're doing a binary expression code generation, you do let me recur on my left child, let me recur on my right child, and let me combine the results into the actual uh, code that I'm generating. So what we're doing here is we're doing that in this shared superclass, but we actually call that shared superclass from the input language specific visitor. So what, this is what that looks like. So as you can see, I am generating an and expression using two ampersands. So that works for Java syntax languages like C, C++, JavaScript, et cetera. But that wouldn't work for something like Python because Python actually uses and as their keyword. So how do we support generating multiple output languages from the same visitor? So we could have a giant switch statement, but that would be annoying. And so instead, we're going to do a similar trick to what we did with the input language and abstract away all of our problems into another class called generators. So the visitors visit the tree, and the generators generate the output. So what this is doing is this is actually treating visitors like they're abstract interfaces. And there are no abstract interfaces in JavaScript, so instead, we're just going to call them a constructed class. So inside of our generators, we have on the left side, we have Python, and on the right side, we have something that would generate JavaScript. What we're doing is we are calling and we're defining an emit method that the shared superclass can then call directly. So it can skip directly from that shared superclass to the generators without knowing or caring what language is actually getting generated at the time. So this is the trick that allows us to write one visitor for every input class, one generator for every output class. So we're doing two classes per language, but that's still a linear solution as opposed to doing it quadratically. So what this looks like when you actually draw an inheritance diagram is we have our antler generated visitor class. So this is the procedurally generated shell empty visitor. We inherit from that the code generation visitor. So this is the uh, all input language code generation visitor that does the logic of actually generating code. We then inherit our input language specific visitor, which is basically wrapping each node so that we don't care about what names we have in our grammars. And then we do the generator. So in any given point, we can compose a transpiler based on all of these different classes. So as you can see here, the order is reversed because we pass the superclass as a parameter to the class that is getting constructed. Does that make sense? Awesome. So is that everything? Almost. So BSON, extended JSON, is not just literals. This is not just language syntax, like native types. We also have a library that MongoDB provides for different types that are maybe not consistent between platforms. So for example, we have a 128 decimal type that we define for um, mostly banks and financial corporations that, do, uh, that need that level of precision. We also have just native language types like date and object ID, which is just a unique identifier for any given document, kind of like a timestamp. So say we are doing a transpilation again from JavaScript to Java. But this time, instead of using a literal like a string, we're going to just use another small building block, which is an object type. So as you can see, there is some slight differences between these two languages. 
namely they have different names and also Java is a language in which we care about new while JavaScript is a language that we do not care about new. Maybe in this case, Python would probably have been a better example, whatever. So now we have two trees. But if you look at these two trees, from the visitor's perspective, they look identical. So how would the visitor know what to do unless they had a giant switch statement, which again, try to avoid switch statements? Is that a problem? We need a symbol table. So this is the last slice of sort of classic compiler design. Almost all compilers use something called a symbol table, which is just a way to keep track of different names. So a symbol is a function, a variable, et cetera. It's anything that is a built-in library. It can also be a user-defined library. It could be potentially scoped. The idea here is that we need a mapping of name to metadata. So now when we are in our visitor and we visit a symbol node, instead of looking it up in a, uh, instead of using a switch statement, we can look it up in this mapping. So the first thing we do is we actually extract the information from the node. So we get the name of the uh, symbol. We look it up in the symbol table. This is also where type information is handled. If it's not in the symbol table, then chances are you either have a typo or you have something that is out of scope. So this is where you would get a, a reference error. And then lastly, we return the name of the function to the parent. So what do we actually put inside of a symbol table? So symbol tables here are defined in YAML. Um, I chose YAML because it's nicer than writing JSON. Um, and it has some interesting features that I can talk about in a second. But you don't really need to worry too much about the specifics of what's in the symbol table. This is just to show you this is the metadata that gets stored. But there is one thing that you do need to know about. So inside of our symbol table, we can also add a piece of metadata, which is a string template. So string templates are exactly what they sound like. They're just simple functions that take in strings and generate strings. However, this is where we actually do the transformation between different languages for the symbols. So we would have a string template for JavaScript that generates, for example, for dates, we can say capital D date. But if we're doing it in Java, that string template would say java.util.date. So every one of the output languages has a YAML file where it defines all of these templates. And these are actually defined separately from the symbol table itself. So we have a symbol table. So the symbol file is on the left, and this is the name of all of the symbols in the input language. We then have our template file, which is a file of functions that define the output in the target language. So what this is doing here is if you're not familiar with uh, YAML functions, what this is doing oops, is just referencing that symbol template. Sorry, that, uh, yeah, the template file. So you put that together and you get a symbol table. So now we have, if you remember from before, our composable transpiler. Now we can also compose a symbol table to give to our transpiler. So first we get symbols, which are defined per input language, and we get templates, which are defined per output language. We combine them and we provide them to the transpiler so that when it reaches a symbol, it can know what to do. So we can even expand that beyond just symbols. We can expand it to literals. We could even expand it as specific as we like. Ultimately, the goal is to define our output languages through these template files in the same way you would define a grammar to a parser generator. So this is how we get a meta transpiler, is we're defining our input language with a series of um, mappings and we define our output language with a series of translations. So, to summarize, we get our tree for free from Antler. We then visit that Antler tree using the generator that we've constructed. We then add our information about translation via a symbol table. So how do you actually add an output language for this example? just add a template file. 
So this has the extra side effect of, say, you are super passionate about R. You don't maybe know too much about compilers, but you know a lot about R. You can fill out that template file, and it's basically like ha doing a quiz on your favorite language. What do you call a date in your language? What do you call an object ID in your language? If you fill that out, all of a sudden, you have support for writing queries and aggregations in, for generating queries and aggregations in your favorite language. So to show you an example of how these templates are really simple, we're going to use long. So again, because different platforms have different implementations, MongoDB provides a long object. But because of coding paradigms between different languages, they have all different names. So in Python, it's called int64. So in our template file for Python, we just return the string int64 when we're given the template for a long. And then we get our result. For Java, there's the native long type, so we can just use that directly. Does the same thing, only difference is within the actual result that gets returned from inside the template. And then we have C Sharp, which does the same thing, but different naming. So as I mentioned before, you can expand this so that you can actually do the vast majority of the translation inside of the templates. This means that we don't even really need generators anymore. Generators were there at the beginning because we weren't thinking about symbol tables. There are cases in which we do want to use generators, and that um, is only when it's a very complicated edge case. So for example, Java has two very different coding paradigms. You can write things in document form, which can map directly to all the other languages. You have a document, key value, and you construct it that way. Or you could do idiomatic Java, which is basically function chaining providing, uh, using all of these different helper methods that are provided by the Java MongoDB driver. So we could use either one of those. So what the generator does for Java is it basically says, do you want idiomatic code? If you do, here's this method chaining. Otherwise, we can defer to the templates and we can just generate regular Java. But that's pretty much the only time we're using generators anymore. So hopefully that wasn't too overwhelming and you have all of the information you need to write your own templates and add support for your favorite language to Compass. So if you want to write an output language, you write the templates. If you want to write an input language, write a visitor. And by visitor, I mean specifically the visitor that just wraps nodes and calls the superclass so that you can normalize the tree that is generated from the parse, from the parser so that it can be used by this shared code generation visitor. Uh, I want to mention that recently I expanded the uh, syntax so that it doesn't only generate um, queries and aggregations. It also can generate, it's kind of small, but it will generate driver code also. So say you want to connect to your server, given the connection information that you provided to Compass when you first started, it will generate code that will use the driver in the language you like to connect and then run your query or aggregation. So I don't know how I'm doing on time, but I'm going to talk very briefly about future features. So we now have a pluggable transpiler. So we have a transpiler that we can actually plug some information into to tell it which language it should translate between. What else can we do? So MongoDB takes our education very seriously. We have this university page which provides all of these samples for MongoDB in shell syntax. But wouldn't it be great if you could see side by side all of these examples that are written on the MongoDB university page in whatever language you're actually learning. So if you're learning to write, to use MongoDB in C++, you don't have to see examples in JavaScript. You can see it in C++ and you can compare them side by side. We can also put it in front of the shell. So right now, the shell is a JavaScript-based shell, which is great for you guys. But potentially, people in Python conferences don't want to use a JavaScript shell. They just want to use the Python shell. So we can put it in front of the shell so that your entire experience with MongoDB from start to finish is in the language you prefer. We could expand it beyond 
query syntax, and we could expand it to entire applications. So if you wanted to write objects, functions, decorators, et cetera, you could do that because all you would need to do is subclass those nodes inside of your visitor. So that's it. Uh, I want to thank my teammates, obviously, who contributed to the project. And everything that I have said is available online in documentation form with a lot more detail. So uh, I'm also around if anyone has questions. If anybody wants to contact me and with help debugging, et cetera, I'm super passionate about getting people involved in this project. So if you have questions, I will answer them. You can email me. That's it. Thank you. One, two, one, two, three. Thank you for your talk. It was super awesome. And we can sit and relax and uh, answer some questions. OK, can I take this off? Uh, please. We have so many questions. And the uh, first question is how to solve the problem if uh, in one language, in, some, in one, uh, I don't know, any of the language, operations are associated from, from the left? left associated mm -hmm. operators, and in the other language, they have like right associated uh, operators. Is there a problem with that? What you would do, yes, there is a problem. Uh, but what you would do is you would then abstract the order of the arguments from the input language, from the shared generator, sorry, the shared visitor that applies to all languages, and you can abstract it into the input language specific generator, uh, visitor, sorry. So what that means is that instead of saying in your superclass visitor, like this dot get arguments, we already have to write this dot get arguments because in some languages it's called args, in some languages it's called arguments, et cetera. So what we would do there is we would have the iterator be, um, defined in the input language specific class. So that's for arguments, but for function calls and uh, stringing, um, it would be the same concept. Yeah. Does that make sense? I get sense? it. Yeah, the next question is, uh, do you have uh, some top level UML class and sequence diagram of your transpiler? Like a <laughs> <Nah>. huge <laughs> paper on the wall. Not UML. I think the closest thing is that slide I showed with the different, um, Objects. There are only four pieces, so it's not. So it's many. not so complicated. Not so complicated. Uh -huh. yeah. uh, okay. Have you ever met the problems to convert some of uh, features, for instance, JavaScript, to any other features of other language? For instance, if there is no such such things in these languages, is there any like forbidden uh, transpilation targets? Uh, from one language to another language? In theory, no. Um, because it's defined as supporting the MongoDB query syntax, and by definition, you have to be able to use MongoDB to the greatest possible capacity, and no matter the language. Um, anything MongoDB related has to be available for every language. Um, I think if you did expand it so that it was more than just query syntax, I think you'd have a hard time implementing like decorators in Python in other languages. It, you, it's doable, but it would be really annoying. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, the next question is, by the way, you can answer your, to answer, you can ask your questions in Russian if you don't understand English. It, it would be a little bit strange because you're sitting here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, is this library can be reused in other cases? So first of all, is it open source? Yes, it's all open source. So do you know, or maybe do you know some examples where you can reuse this library for any other project other than Compass? Yeah. So if you're um, if you're writing code, like for example, if you're a machine learning engineer and you're writing um, functions, most of those functions would probably work really well because you don't have to worry about higher order uh, types like class definitions. So if you want to translate your algorithms between languages, that's probably a good use. Yeah. 
Okay, really nice. And uh, you showed, so for ev every input language, you should uh, write visitor, and for generated uh, language, you have to write generator, obviously. Is there any code reusage between them? For instance, JavaScript and TypeScript, they are really close mm -hmm. to each other, and is there any um, code reuse between between the languages? Yes. So I guess I kind of lied when I said that there's only four classes because when we accept the MongoDB shell syntax, since that's a JavaScript-based language, the shell transpiler actually inherits from the JavaScript or ECMAScript uh, transpiler. So the specifically the the language visitor is two pieces for shell. It's just JavaScript and then it's shell specific stuff. Mm -hmm. So you could do that for any language. Okay, uh, actually, frankly speaking, next question, I am not truly really understand it, but maybe you will. Isn't it possible to use JSON as an IR? Sh show me. I don't know, oh, it's in the last one. Uh, this uh, one. Isn't it possible to use JSON as IR? Um, yeah, you could, so BSON is binary JSON, so I'm assuming when you say BSON you mean the binary representation on disk, um, and you could use that as IR. Um, there are raw BSON, it, binary BSON on disk is also known as raw BSON, so you could use, there are raw BSON parsers in pretty much every language because it's part of the driver spec. Um, so you could encode it and you could decode it. The thing I would say might not be great is that it would be very slow because encoding and decoding BSON is really slow, but also the transpiler is really slow because uh, YAML is slow. So I'm not sure what would be slower. Um, it's not an optimized compiler, so it's not um, meant for transpiling giant pieces of code. Generally, queries and aggregations are quite short. Um, so yeah, that's a good idea. Probably could do that. Nice. and. Can we take an existing generator and tweak it somehow? So, I don't know, tweak template for a single symbol in case, for instance, we're not happy with produce class instance or something like that. Can you say it again? Okay. Uh, can we take an e existing generator and tweak it somehow? Like change uh, output for maybe for single symbol in case we are not happy? Yeah, totally. Um, uh -huh. You can inherit. Uh -huh. And override it. Uh -huh. Nice. Yeah. That's that's super awesome. And uh, another question is, uh, uh, it's a little bit general. Is what articles or books uh, you recommend to learn more about this stuff? Um, this stuff, as like all transpilers. I don't know. Maybe. So the guy who wrote Antler has a blog um, that's really cool and really interesting. Um, the there's a blog post there that was my inspiration for the project, which is about how you could potentially write a transpiler by defining the output language within the original grammar that you feed Antler. Um, so I can provide a link to anyone who wants. Um, but the idea there is that you feed a grammar into the parser generator, and then within the grammar spec, you also define what those um, basically the templates, but instead of having a separate template file, you put the templates directly into the grammar, um, which I thought was super cool. It doesn't work for our case because then you have, again, you have only A to B. You, only, you have your parser definition and you have your output definition in the same file, so you can't swap it out. Um, but the concept is there, and I think that his, um, his blog is really cool and it's very well written, so I recommend that. And our last question is uh, what do you think about meta languages in general? Um, maybe uh, do you know Esperanto and other languages? So I don't. Yeah. So there is one natural language for for humans, mm. like meta language that we all speak in in uh. one language. Do you think uh, can we expect for for the future to have this one? I think that's what maybe they were aiming for when they wrote Go, because. In theory, you should be able to handle stuff that you would generally choose C for, while also having all the nice benefits of something like Python or JavaScript. Um, it's not really working out that way, although I do recommend Go. I think it's a great language. Um, 
I would love it if it was possible, but I think it might not be possible because people um, just stick to what they're really good at. And so if I've spent my whole career writing um, Python and I'm really good at it, I'm probably not going to hop over to a different language. Um, yeah, I guess that's my answer. OK, thank you very much. And you can ask you, you can clap, yeah. <laughs> and actually, uh, you can ask, you, ask your questions in discussion zone, and Anna will be there in five minutes. So thank you very much. Thanks.